The tree line holds its breath. Dawn sits heavy over the fields, all silver mist and distant thunder. Somewhere beyond the hedges, a Russian IFE noses forward, little more than a dark smudge against the grey. Inside a British-made Challenger 2, the Ukrainian gunner is already busy with the invisible math. Wind at cross angle, barometric pressure, barrel temperature, the tiny shimmer of heat haze. The commander's voice is quiet but certain. The loader's hands are clockwork. The tank inhales. One rolling crack of thunder and, a heartbeat later, the distant speck simply ceases to exist. It works like a sniper, the gunner says later, the grin more tired than proud. At five kilometers, that's not bravado, it's a job description. How did a British tank end up writing punctuation marks on a Ukrainian battlefield? The short answer is urgency. Ukraine needed armor that could survive in a sky full of loitering munitions, a ground laced with mines, and an enemy that prefers ambush to duel. It needed a platform that would save the crew even on a bad day and strike accurately on a good one. Britain stepped first, sending 14 Challenger 2s along with training, ammunition, and a very public message. Western heavy armor will fight for Ukraine. The announcement did more than move steel. It shifted the conversation. After months of many nations staring at each other, London broke the ice. Berlin followed with Leopard 2s and Washington eventually unlocked Abrams. The optics mattered, but so did the philosophy. Protect the crew, overmatch at range, live to fire again. The Challenger's mystique is equal parts armor and eyesight. Start with the shell you live in. Dorchester Composite Armor, descendant of the legendary Chobham, is less a material than a promise. Over decades of hard miles and harder fights, it earned a reputation for keeping people alive when physics says they shouldn't be. Crew survival sits at the center of British design, like a stubborn star. Armor that resists penetration. Ammunition divided by protective bulkheads. Fuel and vulnerable components tucked where they do the least harm if the worst happens. Veterans from Basra to Donbass speak about it the same way, quietly. The way you talk about a friend who showed up when everyone else ran. Then there's the gun, which is delightfully contrarian. The Challenger 2's 120mm L30A1 is rifled, not smoothbore like most modern NATO peers. At a glance, that sounds like a trivia question, but it shapes the tank's character. The rifling spins the round, driving stability and precise dispersion. While that means bespoke ammunition, armor-piercing fin-stabilized sabo and high-explosive squash head designed for this barrel, it also means long-range accuracy that borders on rude. Its lineage carries a famous trophy, the longest confirmed tank-on-tank -tank kill in history, scored by a Challenger 1 during the Gulf War at roughly 5 kilometers. Ukrainian crews say the spirit lives on. If the sight picture is clean, we hit, one commander explains. Sometimes you feel the target doesn't even know it's in a fight until the moment it isn't. Accuracy is only a party trick until you can find targets, choose them, and shoot faster than the other guy can think. Here, the Challenger leans on its sensors and workflow. The independent commander's sight allows the boss to scan for the next problem while the gunner is solving the current one. Hunter-killer mode by design, not luck. Digital stabilization, thermal imaging, and a ballistic computer knit together into a weapon that can engage, switch, and re-engage with the surgeon's rhythm. In a battlefield infested with drones, where anything that lingers becomes content on the internet, those seconds you save are the difference between a cam exhale and a frenzied bailout. The battlefield debut in Ukraine wasn't a parade. The southern front around Robotine and Verbove was rough ground. Hedgerows, trenches, belts of mines laid thick enough to tilt the earth. The 82nd Air Assault Brigade, flying the western flag in Ukrainian colors, brought challengers into the fight as part of a combined arms punch meant to break open Russian lines. The first confirmed loss of a Challenger 2 came there, a mine strike that immobilized the tank, followed by a loitering munition that finished the job. The crew walked away. That's the story, stripped down to its bones. Hardware can die, the people inside do not have to. The same pattern has echoed since. Hits that would have been funerals in older designs become repair jobs, shaken hands, and a new hole when the workshops catch up. If obliterating sounds like a headline, what does it mean on the ground? It means using the Challenger as a long-range guardian angel, rather than a battering ram. 
Ukrainian crews rarely charge across open fields. They stage behind tree lines, peek just enough to see, and strike at ranges that make the opponent's return fire feel unfair. They use HE to knock out bunkers and firing points, sabo for anything that shows armor, and smoke whenever quadcopters start circling like hungry gulls. They move in short bursts, two or three hundred meters between covered positions, and they refuse to take the same shot from the same place twice. Sniper work with a 120, a loader calls it. You start to think in arcs and angles, not roads. The harsh realities of this war forced those habits. Russian defenses lean on mine belts, anti-tank guided missiles, and helicopter launched standoff weapons. Add thousands of cheap first person view drones guided by operators who learned on gaming rigs and you get a sky that hunts. Against that threat, the challenger's survivability buys time, but tactics do the rest. Tanks pair with UAV teams who watch from above, queuing targets and warning of incoming. Short exposures minimize the window for a drone to dive. Electronic warfare units jam when they can, mobile air defense escorts swat what they can, and deception buys time. False signatures, dummy positions, smoke that conceals heat as well as sight. It isn't glamorous, it's disciplined. Numbers help sharpen the picture. Britain delivered 14 Challenger 2s in early 2023, along with training packages and ammunition that included the controversial but undeniably effective depleted uranium penetrators. Germany and its partners supplied dozens of Leopard 2s. The United States delivered 31 Abrams. Yet it isn't raw count that gives the Challenger its aura, it's the proportional impact. What the crews say again and again is simple. The tank lets them choose the fight. If they see first, they hit first. And if they're hit in return, they're more likely to climb out, shake off the dust and fight tomorrow. In a war of attrition, fight tomorrow is a strategic weapon. Of course, the British icon isn't a myth. It has warts. The CV-12 diesel delivers about 1,200 horsepower, which is respectable until you boat on supplemental armor and rumble into spring mud. With combat weight pushing past 70 tons, power to weight isn't sprinter quick. In soft soil, the tank can balk, and recovery under constant drone threat is a nail-biting exercise in choreography and profanity. Separate loading ammunition, projectile and charge handled sequentially, can also shave a little speed off the rate of fire compared to one-piece rounds. And then there's logistics. Rifled gun ammo is a specialized supply chain. You can't borrow shells from the neighbors the way you can with smoothbore leopards or Abrams. Keeping a small fleet running in wartime means cannibalizing, hustling spares, and accepting that every fix is a small adventure. Ask the crews whether the trade-offs are worth it, and the answer comes with a grin. The stories tumble out the same way. We survived a direct hit and kept moving. We took fire, the hole rang like a bell, and the only thing damaged was our patience. I trust this tank to bring me back. They talk about the rare moments you get a clean duel, turret against turret, and how those fights end when the other side blinks. They talk about fields they no longer cross because FPVs love them, about tree lines that feel like stage curtains, about the way a thermal site paints a battlefield in black and white, right and wrong, life and death. They talk about how a tank this big somehow makes itself small by refusing to present a target. On the Russian side of the hill, the Challenger is less a technical spec and more a rumor with teeth. Its silhouette and thunder carry a psychological weight that outstrips its small numbers. Morale isn't a statistic you can audit, but you can feel it. Infantry who know a Challenger is watching their sector walk a bit taller. Russian crews who know one might be scanning their avenue of approach drive a bit warier. The enemy adapts, cope cages on turrets, ad hoc armor that raises profiles and reduces agility, more dependence on Ka-52 helicopters, slinging missiles from outside shoulder-fired air defense range, more FPV drones scouting and striking. Some of those adaptations help, others create new vulnerabilities. A cage that blocks a drone can also snag in brush, degrade optics, and make a tank handle like a wardrobe on ice. 
A helicopter that hunts tanks becomes a target for every air defense battery in three districts. Comparison clarifies the Challenger's niche. Leopard 2s bring smoothbore commonality and deep European supply lines. Abrams bring a superb fire control system and turbine tempo when the maintenance tail is there to feed it. The Challenger brings the stubborn insistence that crews should survive and that long-range accuracy is its own kind of armor. All three are lethal platforms in trained hands. All three suffer when used alone, without infantry, engineers, drones, and air defense. Ukraine's experience is less about proving which tank is best and more about proving which tactics keep them alive. The British machine proves especially strong in the role of distant executioner, a guardian that bites at ranges where the response takes just a little too long to matter. If you want a map, start in the south. The Zaporizhia sector around Robotine and Verbove saw Challenger 2s working alongside Bradleys, Strikers and Leopard 2s during the hard fighting of 2023. Later, as the war's geometry twisted again, reputable reports suggested Ukrainian units brought Challengers into cross-border actions toward Russia's Kursk region. London refused to narrate operational specifics, as governments often do, but never suggested its armor had to stay neatly on one side of a line, if international law permitted otherwise. The practical lesson is simpler. Wherever the front requires a long-range punch that can survive counterpunches, the challengers tend to appear like stagehands in black, quietly, effectively, and gone before the curtain call. British crews have long joked that the challenger brings its own kettle. Ukrainian crews say that's fine, as long as it also brings the tea when the quadcopters stop by unannounced. One commander calls the CR2 a sniper who drinks tea. Another says it's the grumpy uncle, slow to stand up, terrifying when he does. There's wisdom hidden in the jokes. A platform that's a little slow, but very hard to kill, is exactly the sort of friend you want when mines lurk under every blade of grass. What about the future? The British Army's Challenger 3 upgrade is already penciled onto calendars. It keeps the soul, crew first, survivability, British stubbornness, and swaps in a NATO standard 120mm smoothbore for ammunition commonality, a new digital turret, improved sensors, and more growth headroom for active protection and counter drone tools. Think of it as taking the sniper and fitting it with better optics, a broader ammunition menu, and a faster brain. Ukraine's lessons are being baked into that design. The value of standoff fires, the necessity of networking with drones and electronic warfare, the life or death importance of hiding in plain sight. None of this means tank on tank duels decide the war. They don't. Artillery, drones, electronic warfare, logistics, the boring words, write most of the story. But when tanks do matter, they matter in the way bridges matter. They carry infantry across bad places. They anchor flanks when everything else feels liquid. They turn a contested hedgerow into a safe corridor, because the other side doesn't want to roll dice at four kilometers. The Challenger 2 excels in that kind of quiet coercion. It bends the engagement without needing to star in the explosion reel. Limitations deserve daylight, again because honesty keeps viewers and crews alive. The big British hull is as heavy as the truth. It requires careful route planning and bridge assessment. It begs for well-rehearsed recovery teams, and it punishes commanders who loiter. Bespoke ammunition demands coordination and disciplined inventory, not improvisation. And while Dorchester armor does heroic things, it is not witchcraft. Concentrated hits, top attack munitions, and repeated strikes can and do kill challengers. Survivability is a probability, not a guarantee. The victories belong as much to process as to place. For Ukraine, the sum of these parts is a repertoire. Tree lines become ambush curtains. Thermal sights become lie detectors in the fog. UAV operators become spotters with an eagle's view. Challenger crews become patient predators, moving in short classy steps across a chessboard they refuse to rush. The language they use, overwatch, hold down, displacement, smoke, sounds old. The way they execute, queuing from drones, working inside a digital kill chain, dodging quadcopters that cost less than a good bicycle, feels new. It isn't that tanks are obsolete, it's that tanks operating without this network are obsolete. The Challenger 2, paradoxically, proves the tank's relevance by refusing to fight like it's 1989. There's also the unquantifiable, how a force behaves when it trusts its equipment. 
Ukrainian infantry speak of feeling taller when a challenger is on net, of pushing a little farther because they know a precise 120 mm sentence will end a paragraph of trouble if it starts to form. Russian troops, for their part, react with the caution earned from experience. They throw missiles and drones at the British silhouette because they've learned that ignoring it is worse. Morale isn't magic, its consequences remembered. If you're collecting memorabilia, the quotes make a fine shelf. It works like a sniper. We survived a direct hit and kept moving. At five kilometers, it still hits. Dry humor rounds out the edges. Challenger, the tank that refuses to retire. A kettle with a cannon. These lines travel because they're rooted in lived events. The kind that get retold over bad coffee at 0300. The jokes land because they're told by people who've heard a hull ring like a church bell and chosen to get back inside anyway. So, are UK Challenger tanks obliterating Russian tanks? If by obliterating you mean assembling a highlight reel of turret tosses every afternoon, not quite. That's not how modern war works. If by obliterating you mean dictating engagements, landing first round kills at rude distances, surviving hits that should have written elegies, and forcing the enemy to spend disproportionate blood and treasure to counter a small, stubborn fleet, then yes, in the ways that matter most. The effect isn't cinematic, it's cumulative. It's a line on a staff map that won't bend, a patrol that returns with the same names it left with, a rumor in the enemy's head that slows his hand on the throttle. The last word belongs to the opening shot. That distant silhouette erased by a single thunderclap was not a fluke. It was doctrine expressed through steel. See first, hit first, live to shoot again. That's the challenger's creed on Ukrainian soil. Whether shadowing the hedgerows of Zaporizhia or stalking the rumor-thick borders near Kursk, tanks aren't dead. Stupid tanking is. The British machine is neither loud nor careless. It is quiet, rude, and very hard to kill. What do you think? Does long-range gunnery define the future of tank warfare? Or will sheer numbers and mobility always rule the map? Drop your take below and join the debate. And since every story needs a closing line, here's ours. The challenger doesn't shout. It whispers across five kilometers and the target never hears the punchline.